Hello, I'm Ooh. Michael Opitz, your host, and I want to welcome you to our first Internet radio broadcast. There are a lot of good radio shows and fewer TV shows that attempt to share accurate, in-depth news and relevant information. Often the big networks play to an audience comprised of other news professionals and the big corporation ownership with the result that we, the listeners, receive only partial information and sometimes we get distortion of the facts or just outright lies, causing us to yell at the radio or TV. For our show, we are just citizens who are supported by a network of people who share information and stories that provide insight that is not offered by the big media. And this show is about sharing that information with a special perspective of accurate facts, information, and truth. Also, as the show progresses, I'll bring in special guests with their expert knowledge and unique perspectives on topics currently in the news. These discussions will not be superficial, and I think you'll find them very interesting. My guest host is Christina Jeffrey, Ph.D. political science, former House historian and college professor. She is both smart and knowledgeable. She is one of a small minority of conservative college professors. I've known Christina for years, but Christina, you may want to review your background as well. Hi, Christina. Michael, I'm sorry. I'm a little slow on the uptake here. How are you? Oh, wonderful. Glad glad, glad that you're here. Many thanks. Um, our topic, of course, is the, is the crisis in Syria and the reaction that the American president wants to, wants to uh, take, which is a limited, if we're to understand correctly, is a limited punitive strike. Uh, on the uh, on the forces of the government in in Syria, are we are we even that clear on what it is he's going to strike? Uh, no, no, we're not that clear at all. He's not uh, he's not indicated. Uh, uh, he has said uh, that this is to punish uh, Assad. That's an interesting uh, way to go to war, or because this is going to war when you have an act of war. But that leads us to uh, to another issue that probably we need to address as we get into this, because we've heard so much distortion of the facts, uh, both from uh, members of Congress as well as the media. And that is, and the president has said that he has absolute right uh, to launch an attack on Syria. Now, attack is on another country is an act of war. It is a declaration of war. If anyone attacked any of our territories, our possessions, or the United States with missiles, cruise missiles or otherwise, uh, I know without a doubt everybody would consider that an act of war and we would immediately respond. And the president under the War Powers Act has that ability when we are threatened or an attack is imminent or an attack is happening. Uh, so Congress gives them, uh, the president, uh, uh, a, a limited period of time, 60 days, I believe, to uh, to uh, uh, respond before Congress can get together and declare war. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on that, Christina? Well, that is correct. That's the War Powers Act uh, of 1973 passed in the wake of the Vietnam War. And it can be looked at as simply codifying the Constitution's um, war powers, uh, presidential war powers, and and specifying more more carefully what um, Congress expects if the president is going to come to Congress and ask for an authorization of war. Uh, Congress is sort of laying out some procedures that they want the president to follow. Every president has said that the War Powers Act is unconstitutional. No president has ever, uh, you know, gone to court to challenge it. It would be very foolish for them to do so because Congress has some real constitutional powers, whether they have the power to pass a war power, you know, whether the War Powers Act is constitutional or not, Congress has the power to raise armies. Maybe it has the powers to unraise them. It has the power to of the purse, 
to fund or to not fund uh, actions of the president. And, and Congress has exercised those powers um, on occasion. Certainly in the Iran-Contra business, it passed something called the Bolin Amendment, which said that the president couldn't do anything to fund the rebels in uh, Nicaragua, right? Yes, Nicaragua. Right, in Nicaragua. So this is a, it's a somewhat murky area. Presidents have to have energy in the executive. Uh, they would be faulted by every, all concerned, including Congress, if they didn't act swiftly to a, a provocation uh, to national sovereignty and the safety of the, of the country. Um, so there is an implied power there that the president has. Congress has the implied powers, though, um, to, I think, to demand that if war is going to be precipitated by presidential action, when the president isn't acting swiftly in response to a threat and he's sitting around taking his time and signaling to Congress that he's going to do something, I think uh, I think Congress's implied power is to say, "Whoa, wait a minute." Uh, yeah, uh, that is correct. If we look under uh, Article One of the Constitution and Section Eight, and I'm not going to get wonky here with the Constitution, but it's important to understand uh, for the listeners to understand. And this that, is Constitution uh, Month. This is Constitution Month, and the Constitution is what sets us apart from virtually every other nation in the world. We are a nation of laws and not of men to arbitrarily uh, 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 act on their whims. But in Article 8, it says Congress has the power to declare war, to make the rules of the government and regulation of the land and naval forces, to provide for calling forth the militia, to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, repel invasions, to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining of the, of the militia. So, and on it goes. So the responsibility is clearly with Congress. So when President Obama states that he has full constitutional authority to act without Congress, uh, either he does not know the Constitution or he's being entirely disingenuous. Well, it could be either. Just because you're a college professor teaching law doesn't mean that you have necessarily any knowledge of the Constitution. I don't think they teach a lot of constitutional law in uh, in the law schools. And I think Harvard he's disbarred law, anyway. Yeah, Harvard Law School, uh, constitutional law is not a required course. <laughs> well, that says it all. Imagine that. <laughs> well, uh, I think... For us, the Constitution was written for we the people to limit government. Uh, the president has less interest in limiting government than, than we do. So if, if government is to be limited, it's going to require that the people themselves exercise their sovereignty through their representatives by sending a very loud message to Congress as to our expectations. Uh, I would I would agree with that, and, and if we can go back uh, to the uh, our early history, uh, the Constitution was drafted by citizens. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was not a uh, a government official, so it was the citizens of that day uh, representing the states. Now he may have been a state representative, but it's important for everybody to uh, to understand that the federal government was created by the individual states, and they did not abdicate uh, uh, a supreme power to the federal government. They uh, uh, allowed only 17 of, of uh, areas, enumerated powers, if you will, to the federal government. And everything that outside those 17 enumerated powers fall to the states under the Tenth Amendment and to the people. Well, and, and reinforcing what you said, everybody who attended those ratifying conventions in each of the states uh, was required to be not a legislator. Oh, that's a great point. That's right. The people elected those among them whom they trusted with their knowledge and judgment to ratify. And the Constitution was published in every, virtually every newspaper of the land, so the average citizen 
uh, read it and understood it, unlike today where we say only those people uh, in black robes can discern the meaning of uh, the Constitution. We mere mortals and citizens cannot, even though it was uh, our forebears who wrote it and uh, our forebears also who approved it, ratified it through the states. And largely they were non-lawyers, those doing the ratifying. Yeah, and the document does not read like a legal document. So uh, great insight. Anything else, Christina, that uh, that you want to uh, uh, talk about regarding uh, this potential war with Syria and President Obama's uh, statement that he does not need congressional approval even though he would like to have it? President Obama is is has an amazing amazing style. Usually, you expect uh, a kind of uh, diplomacy um, between the three branches of government because each branch does have its its checks, its ability to check the other branch. Mr. Obama doesn't seem to seems seems to be uh, magnanimously allowing Congress to weigh in, even though uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, whether they vote up or down, the implication is he's going to do whatever he wants, and that's um, that's a very bad. That to me is the very bad precedent. Some people say, well, going to con- you know, going to Congress that you know that reinforces the bad precedent that George Bush set of going to Congress. Well, to me, it's not a bad precedent. You you take hostile action, a war may result. You might as well get the approval of Congress up front. And it shows a respect to another branch of government. But Mr. Obama wants to make it very clear that he certainly doesn't want to be misunderstood as showing respect for Congress. And uh, he's, you know, making speeches abroad in which he says, uh, you know, nothing's going to be his fault. Um, there's, um, you know, the, the internet the reputation of the international community, the reputation of Congress are on the line. I, I mean, he's just a midwife. Um, uh, helping people to do the right thing that they should do anyway, and, and which he will do uh, whether they, you know, whether they go along with him or not. Well, if he acts in violation of the Constitution and Congress, and launches war against uh, Syria, uh, those could be very, very serious grounds for impeachment. Uh, and well, I don't know. The con- con- our Congress is not a very manly Congress, and and. Unfortunately, the, a lot of those votes are going to come from <clears throat> the least manly of the members of Congress. So uh, I don't, I unfortunately, don't see them standing up and saying, "Well, you've crossed the red line, Mr. President, and now we're going to impeach you." I wouldn't mind hearing that kind of language, but I certainly expect I, I will not. There's one other thing too, Michael, that I think we can't ignore, and that is the very questionable. Uh, people that we are coming in on the side of. Um, our government doesn't trust those rebels. That's why they haven't armed them to date. Now suddenly they're going to trust them and arm them. But and you know John McCain says they're becoming more moderate. But no, there's no proof of that. I haven't seen any anything that would make me believe it. They're still slaughtering Christians and and. Um, and acting in a very lawless manner. They certainly aren't um, uh, followers of the Geneva Conventions over there on either side. And I don't know what a moderate Islamicist is. Does that mean he only supports Sharia law? Well, if he does that, then he's for the implications. Uh, he's for, yeah, yeah, maybe. He only, he, only, he only kills infidels if they resist. Oh, okay. And uh, and that brings us to another point, and it's understanding the psyche. Uh, it's almost as if our uh, our congressional members and our media have uh, become uh, stupid or mentally unstable that uh, we would even consider going to war uh, against a country who has not, whose leader, although very despicable, it's not been proven. Uh, that uh, he launched the chemical weapons. As a matter of fact, it would be so much to his disadvantage that he'd do that because everybody would focus on him. And we've all seen false flag operations uh, going throughout our history, including the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, which uh, started the Vietnam conflict, stating that North Vietnamese gunboats 
attacked our warships. I've always had this image of a little tiny tugboat attacking a destroyer or a battleship. And we find out later that that never happened. So uh, I, I yeah. am just absolutely astounded that, uh, but there must be hidden agendas here that we haven't yet discovered. That I think they were. were you well mean things paper. couldn't be as stupid as they look? Oh my! <laughs> Aren't you? Well, <laughs> yeah. They, they, I think they possibly could be as stupid as they look. But one of the big motives for for this strike is is our national standing and our respect among the nations of the world and certainly I think we should be concerned about our respect you know declaration of independence is that uh, we have a concern for the opinions of mankind but if we if we bomb we, if we launch a punitive strike because of the use of chemical weapons and it turns out that those chemical weapons actually were in the hands of the rebels uh, and we know that the rebels did capture some chemical weapons, so that's not implausible. And we didn't, and we took all this time and didn't take enough time to make sure that we knew what we were talking about. It is the whole weapons of mass destruction um, business that we went through in the Persian Gulf. And why would we want to repeat that? That sad history. Oh, absolutely, and and I'm not quite sure what a weapon of mass destruction is. Is that where you killed a uh, uh, hundred people, or a thousand people, or uh, ten thousand, or more? Well, it's 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 not like abortion where you kill babies one at a time. Yeah. Uh, so it's more than one, and maybe um, you know maybe less than. Well, I suppose if you blew up the whole world, that would definitely be a, a mass destruction. Somewhere it? in between those two extremes. Uh, Stalin said the uh, the death of one person is a tragedy. The death of millions is merely a statistic. And with that, what I'd like to do now is introduce uh, Ph.D. Tim Furnish, an expert in Middle East affairs. And Tim, please inform the listeners about your background and experience. Oh, well, thanks, Michael. Um, I am Ph.D. Middle East Islamic uh, African world history, and uh, I served in the military for some time, and then I've been as a college professor for a bit, and as I tell people, forgive me, Christina, I'm a recovering college professor, um, and she probably knows why I say that, because there are about six of us, as you pointed out, Michael, in the entire United States that are conservative, well, five now that I've left, and um, I have been working for the last four or five years as a consultant to the military, and in some some wises to the intelligence community and issues having to do with Islamic terrorism, various Islamic ideologies. So I wanted to weigh in here and add on to some of what you guys have been talking about, about Syria. Please do. Uh, well, three major points, and some of them you've touched on, but I kind of want to elaborate and throw one more in. Um, uh, the key thing is, as you've already broached, the idea uh, that we are certain that the regime, the, the al-Assad regime, used chemical weapons. That is by no means certain. There are reports from Russian intelligence and other places, uh, including um, some contacts I have, one in Syria and one uh, in a neighboring country. Uh, there's, there's indications that uh, it's very possible that the, uh, some of the opposition groups used chemical weapons, either obtained through pilfered government stores or perhaps even supplied by Saudi Arabia. Again, this is uh, it's conjecture about where they come from, but there is some evidence, if not proof, that the, that the opposition, some of the opposition groups, have actually uh, used them. So it's by no Jim, means certain. Your comments on this are very important because I haven't heard in the media anywhere that some of these chemical weapons could have come from Saudi Arabia, our supposed ally. So please continue. Yes, it's, it's possible. I think it's more likely that they got them from one of the pilfered government inventories, but uh, no one knows for sure. But the point remains, uh, Kerry is just frankly, uh, well, I'll just use Putin's language. Kerry is frankly lying when he says he knows for sure, uh, that we know for sure that the government of Syria did this. We do not. Secondly, in sort of an ancillary point is, and, and you guys have touched on this again a little bit, um, the whole issue of chemical weapons. Um, I would submit that a lot of the revulsion at chemical weapons and sort of the knee-jerk response to it is emotional. Chemical weapons are horrible. I mean, 
course, don't know this by personal experience, thank God. From what I've read about it as a historian and from what I learned about it when I was in the military, um, you know, one of the things we had to do in the military was once a year go into a uh, gas chamber and take off our masks. Thank God it was just tear gas. But that was bad enough. I can't imagine something even more horrible than that, of course. Um, so gas is very, very, uh, very, 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 I think, revolting issue to people. But I think a lot of it's emotional. And as you were starting to talk about there toward the end, um, you know, how do you define a weapon of mass destruction? Well, in a sense, uh, a gas is because you can kill more people quickly. But is it more horrific? Um, Christine, I believe you brought up abortion. Is it, uh, I, w- I would think that uh, a good analogy for the Middle East is decapitation. Um, you know, Islamic rubrics, rubrics on beheading are employed by a lot of the opposition groups, and we have, we have videos of some of the opposition groups beheading people, particularly Christians. Um, so uh, is it worse if you kill 100 people with a poison gas shell or if you just chop the heads off of five or six or eight people at a time? Um, I guess uh, under international law, the, the latter is, or the former is probably worse, but I, I think they're both equally revolting. So um, the international community has long ago decided, most of the international community has long ago decided that, that, that gas is, quote-unquote, uh, a war crime. But there have been instances in modern history where gas has been employed. And I note that um, uh, Nancy Pelosi was making uh, a, a, a statement the other day about how we need to go after uh, the Syrian government uh, because they used gas. And, you know, the use of gas automatically means that something should be done. Well, she didn't have that feeling when Saddam Hussein was gassing thousands of Kurds in northern Iraq. She I still remember that. Against, she still voted against George Bush doing anything about that. So, um Things have changed, haven't they? All right, so that's the second issue. The third big issue I want to bring up, which which really I don't think you guys got to touch on, is sort of the nature of the Syrian regime and the sort of sectarian and um, the, the, the breakdown of the various groups in Syria. And I don't have time to go into all of this, obviously, but just briefly. Um, Hafez al-Assad is a member of a basically what is a, a heretical offshoot of Islam called Alawi. They're called Alawis. The Alawis uh, purport to be 12 or Shia, like the Shia of Iran and Iraq. But in reality, if you deconstruct their, their beliefs and their teachings, which I've done in a number of articles, uh, they really are apostate Muslims. And they have a lot of practices that aren't, aren't even Islamic at all. There have when been, you say apostate Muslims, would you explain to the listeners what you mean by that? Yes, Muslims that are considered by mainstream Sunni Muslims to not be Muslims at all. Um, their beliefs are so outside the pale that they are not even deemed to be even a subsect of Islam. They're deemed to be a foreign religion. And in fact, uh, sort of the, the godfather of modern Islamic fundamentalism, a guy named Ibn Taymiyyah, who lived in the 14th century, issued several fatwas, uh, religious rulings against them, way back in the early in, in, in the 14th century, calling them worse than Jews and Christians because they pretend to be Muslims, but they really aren't. And people whose um, these Alawis, they are people whose lives and property can be taken at any time uh, because, again, they are just deemed so outside the pale. Now, these sorts of fatwas have been resurrected in the, in the Syrian civil war, and a number of the uh, most prominent Islamist groups opposed to al-Assad, like Jabhat al-Nusra in particular, uh, have, have basically reiterated these and basically said, if we take over, we're going to kill as many of these Alawis as we can. The Alawis make up about 10% of Syria's population, so several million. In addition to this, the Alawi government basically is protecting the Christians. About another 10% or so of the population of Syria is Christian, uh, Orthodox, uh, Eastern Catholic, Melkite, a few other sects. And many, many, many of these Christians, probably most of them, have supported uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad and his father Hafez, who died in 2000, but took over in 1970, because they were a bulwark against and have been a bulwark against the Muslim Brotherhood, Salafi, Islamic fundamentalist attempted takeovers of Syria. So basically we find ourselves in this curious position, which I guess should, I should probably shouldn't use the term curious since Obama's been doing it for five years, this position where the, the government of the United States is basically supporting basically Islamic fundamentalist Sunnis in various places. I mean, he did this in Syria. He, he supported the Muslim Brotherhood over against first Hosni Mubarak, and still, to a large extent, is supporting the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt over against the people that deposed them, um, primarily the military. And who, is, so we, who, is the, yes. who is the sponsor of the Muslim Brotherhood? 
ask? Is that well, a good the question to ask? You mean monetary sponsor? Yeah, uh, uh, and country. What country? Uh, well, there are countries? a number of places where the Brotherhood gets their money. The Muslim Brotherhood actually has a lot of intrinsic support in the countries where it's found. I'm not saying it's just simply an alien belief. It's it, you know, it's an intrin- It was a, originally a, an Egyptian. Um, sort of re-Islamization movement started back in the 1930s and 1940s in Egypt. And it gets, in the modern world, they get a lot of support from uh, uh, some of the Gulf countries, not Saudi Arabia. The Saudis are are, are very opposed to the Muslim Brotherhood. Some of the other Gulf countries, particularly Qatar, tend to support the Brotherhood. But they do have a lot of support in various countries. And for instance, like in the Palestinian territories of Israel, Hamas is the Palestinian... um, branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. And they get money from the people there, you know, through the mosques. So, But in terms of outside support, it tends to be a few of the Gulf countries. Um, so anyway, the, the whole thing in Syria that we have to keep in mind that hardly anyone's talking about, except I've seen Rand Paul is really the only one who really talks about this, is that if the government of al-Assad falls, and although we may say we don't want regime change, any military strikes against his installations are going to weaken him and weaken the, 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 the Alawi government. Um, if that regime falls, then it's possible that one of the non-Islamic fundamentalist groups, most notably the Free Syrian Army, which is mainly made up of defectors from the government, uh, both military and government defectors, it's possible they could take over. But it's also quite possible that the, um, there, and there are eight or nine at least of these Islamic fundamentalist groups, besides Jabhat al-Nusra, uh, that they will take over, or at least they'll take over part of the country. And, if, and, and they tend to predominate north, uh, and if they take over, they're going to probably slaughter. They'll certainly slaughter the Alawis, and it's very likely they'll also slaughter many Christians. So uh, I don't know if anyone in our government's ever thinking about, has even thought about that sort of thing. Um, and there's also another, I should add, too, that another sort of major concern in Syria besides the religious um, sectarian issue is the tribal issue. There, there are a number of um, – another 10 percent or so of the population of Syria is Kurds. They're not Arabs. Uh, the Kurds are a whole separate uh, ethnic group, ethno-linguistic group. Most of them are Sunni Muslim, some are Shia. They live mainly in the northeast and north of the country. And, uh, you know, we know about the Kurds because when we – basically we helped them set up a, a almost independent state in northern Iraq – um, uh, but they, the Kurds are sort of the thorn in the side of most of the Arab countries and also Turkey in the Middle East because there are 25 to 30 million of them and they don't have an independent country, uh, which they've wanted once since World War One. So you've got that issue there, the Kurds, and then some of the other Arab tribes uh, in Syria, some of whom are on the side of the regime, some of whom are opposed to the regime. So that, that, that's another sort of very complicating factor. In terms of outside players, uh, you know, as we all know, I think, Iran tends to support – Iran doesn't tend to. Iran does support the regime, uh, the Alawi regime, the Assads. Um, Turkey is against the regime and in favor of the opposition, as is Saudi Arabia. Uh, Israel is sort of just waiting on the sideline with their uh, anti-missile systems activated in case they need to. And then, of course, Russia – supports the regime. Now, there are, there are economic reasons for this, strategic reasons for this. Uh, you know, they have sold a lot of military hardware to, to um, Syria over the years. They've even got Russian um, uh, trainers and advisors in Syria, although there have been reports they're getting those out because they don't want them killed by any American strikes. Um, Russia has economic interest in, in Syria. And also, however, uh, Putin has been very outspoken in the last six months or so about this issue of protecting the Christians in um, in Syria, partly I think under pressure from the from the Orthodox um, Patriarch of Moscow, who has sort of leaned on him about this. So that's I think some of why Russia is doing what they do. Plus I think Putin just personally does not like Obama and sort of likes to embarrass him every chance he gets. So um, uh, the final thing let me say about this is that. In the last decade or so, since 9-11, we have basically altered the Middle Eastern political landscape in many ways. You know, we went into Afghanistan, which was, I think, certainly quite justified. Uh, But then we went into Iraq, which with much less uh, justification, one could say, you know, at the very least. 
we got rid of Saddam Hussein. And Saddam, for all of his nastiness, was a bulwark against um, Islamic fundamentalists. Basically, Saddam, as well as al-Assad, the senior al-Assad, and then Bashar, who runs the country now, were both members of something called the Ba'ath Party, which is basically an Arab socialist sort of secular party. And Saddam ruled not as a hardcore Muslim, but as a, basically an Arab secular ruler. Same thing for the Assads. Um, so we, redo, we, we got rid of Saddam, who was, if nothing else, certainly an enemy of the, of the jihadists in the world. We helped get rid of Gaddafi in Libya. And Gaddafi, you know, those of us that remember the 80s and President Reagan, Gaddafi was sort of a pain in our side, or as President Reagan would have said, a pain in our keister back in the 80s, and we had some airstrikes against him. But after we invaded um, Iraq in 2003, Gaddafi sort of turned over a leaf and realized that he could very well be next. And he basically started crushing the Islamic opposition in his country and started cooperating with Western intelligence agencies to help us hunt down jihadists, particularly in North Africa. But now he's gone, and now Libya is vacillating back and forth with how, how much Islam and Sharia law it's going to have in its government. Um, Mubarak, uh, we certainly didn't do anything to help Mubarak. Uh, President Obama didn't. Um, so he was, of course, a bulwark against the Muslim Brotherhood. And then we know the Muslim Brotherhood won, but now that has been somewhat reversed by the army taking over again. But basically, in the last decade, the United States, under two administrations, not just this one, has basically removed three major Middle Eastern leaders who were, uh, you know, standing up against the real threat to the United States, which is this the al-Qaeda-affiliated groups, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Islamic fundamentalist groups. Do we really want to go in and help remove another one? I, don't, I would submit that that's probably not a good idea. Um, so um, I think that's something that really needs to be looked at, and I don't, uh, you know, I don't hear a whole lot of people uh, talking about it from that angle. I remember a, a Saddam Hussein making a comment after it uh, became apparent that the United States was going to lead a coalition to uh, in, uh, invade Iraq. He said, the Americans don't under, if they take over, they don't understand what's going to happen to them with these radical fundamentalists who are so difficult to control, and it will become their nightmare. Well, That's a rough you know, quote. He, was, he was largely right about that, wasn't he? He was. We keep thinking that uh, if we have a democratic government in any of these Middle Eastern countries, if people are democratically elected, then they will follow the democrat, democratic rule. But we're reminded of Hitler was democratically elected. He fooled the people, and then as soon as he got to power, he then began to uh, uh, become tyrannical. And that's what we have seen with the Muslim Brotherhood. We mustn't forget that the Muslim Brotherhood was the group that assassinated Anwar Sadat because he reached out to uh, to Israel to uh, form a peace accord. Michael, let me let me just slightly correct you on that. That's not technically true. No. Uh, Sadat was not killed by by the Muslim Brotherhood. No, the Muslim Brotherhood has always officially eschewed violence, if for no other reason they know that they would have been crushed if they had openly worked. Of rebellion into into their into their um, agenda. No, uh, he was fast. Sadat was assassinated in 1981 by uh, e Egyptian Islamic Jihad. Egyptian Islamic Jihad was disavowed by the Muslim Brotherhood. In fact, they they had broken away from the Muslim Brotherhood because they thought the Brotherhood, because the Brotherhood would not engage in violent jihad. So, yeah, it technically was not the Muslim Brotherhood that killed Sadat. But I, I would also corrected. thank you. Yes, I would also argue, however, that. Um, it's too easy, and this is another point that I'm glad you brought that up because that brings me to a larger point that I probably should have made. You hear a lot of commentators keep talking about um, al-Qaeda, al-Qaeda, al-Qaeda in Syria. And they keep talking, like, you know, the, the, only, like the only threat to the United States is al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is simply the tip of the spear of, of, of Islamic fundamentalism and the desire ultimately to, to recreate a caliphate, Islamic, the entire Islamic world united under one leader, which only existed for about 11 seconds in Islamic history. But this is sort of the golden age to which the jihadists and other people that aren't jihadists, frankly, aspire. The, the Muslim Brotherhood, I, I always have to correct people, it, Muslim Brotherhood really is not a terrorist organization, but that doesn't make it any less of a threat. In fact, I think it's a greater threat because the Muslim Brotherhood has a much longer view of things. They don't strap 
you know, IEDs on and blow people up. They don't blow themselves up in, in pizza joints. But they have a longer-term agenda of whatever society they're in, of Islamizing that society and having Islamic law put into place. And, and I think that's a greater threat because we can handle the military threat. The ideological, philosophical threat, I think we've proven that we have a hard time with. And these are many of the people affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood and with CARE, Council on American Islamic Relations, who are advising the president. Well, the president I mean, his, has invited them into a, uh, a, a sort of a cabinet advisory role, hasn't he? Yeah, sort of a kitchen cabinet. I mean, yeah. and the director of central intelligence, John Brennan, is some of my friends in the counterintelligence world, counterterrorism world, are convinced that Brennan is actually a Muslim. I don't think that he's actually a Muslim. He was he was he was station CIA station chief for a while in Riyadh, and he speaks Arabic. But but I don't think he's actually a Muslim. I think he's like Obama. I think he, you know his only belief is in himself, and he has convinced himself that um, it's in the United States' geostrategic interest to sort of cozy up to Islam. And I think that's ultimately very, very dangerous and foolish, but that's, that's, a sign of peop- that's the kind of people that are advising this president. And, and so I, I don't really tend to see any sort of like very vast, any sort of vast conspiracy on Obama's part. I just tend to think that he's He's just so hubris-ridden. You know, he, he is convinced that he knows the Islamic world better than anybody else. I mean, we, know, we saw this from you know, his first summer when he was in office, that, that much vaunted Cairo speech, which half the things he said in that, in that speech, half the things he said in that speech were just historically untrue. But, you know, he was going to do a great reset with the Islamic world because unlike that Rube Bush, you know, he, he knows much better. And now we find that um, things... The, the Islamic world vis-a-vis the United States, um, the hatred is up even worse than it was when Bush was president. So I, I think this president and his advisors are pushing him in this direction of, you know, trying to support the Sunni majority in Syria, but the Sunni majority in Syria is mostly being um, represented by these Islamist groups. And, 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 and also I think the president's getting pressure from um, Saudi Arabia, who also supports the same side, Qatar, um, and, you know, he just got a bunch of advisors who realized that he embarrassed himself greatly with this red line remark. Oh, which, of course, he now didn't say. But his That's red right. line yeah. remark, yeah, his red line remark now, he looks not just incompetent, but foolish and weak, and they have to do something about it. And I really think a lot of this is simply driven by domestic U.S. political concerns for the president. Well, it's uh, such a tangled web that we have here, and I'm looking at Drudge uh, as we speak, and uh, a statement that Russia warns of nuclear disaster if Syria is attacked. So we're clearly living in uh, more dangerous times because Russia has a strong interest and uh, has warships in the area now, and as you mentioned, uh, troops, advisors, if you will, on the ground in Syria. So the stakes are really ratcheting up. Tim, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your insight. It's very valuable in helping uh, inform uh, me and those of us on this call as well as the listeners. Uh, It's time to – is there another point you would like to make before I introduce our next uh, participant? No, sir. I think I've taken up enough of your time. Go ahead. No, you haven't taken up any of the time. You've been a strong contributor, and it's appreciated. But it's time for us to bring in James Strawn. James is an IT consultant and solutions architect with decades of experience working on various major projects with Fortune 500 companies. He's also an author and editor for DecidingTheVote.com, a blog forum for politically active citizens and professionals. James is also the technical producer for the show, and his talent is appreciated. James? Thank you, Michael. I appreciate the Appreciate your kind words and uh, pointing out that I'm getting much older now through my decades of experience there. But uh, <laughs> nonetheless, uh, as you know, with deciding the vote, one of the things that uh, the the team is responsible for is following uh, not just you know what's happening with the email stream, but also what's happening in the social media world. And so what I've what I've seen over the past few days in the advent of of uh, Discussion about the attack on Syria is um, is is really no decline in the polarization of of what I'm seeing in social media, particularly. 
So when this whole thing started, uh, I believe the poll showed that uh, approval was below 10 percent for, for an attack on Syria. And that uh, that's not changed much. So if you look at the USA Today, they'll they'll tell you that it's up around 29 percent. But I can tell the, tell you that anecdotally that does not track to what I continue to see both in the email stream that I participate in and, and in the social media that I monitor. So, so I have my questions about that. Uh, but I wanted to reflect on one of the interesting stories that um, that has fallen outside of the popular press or outside of the, the mainstream media, I guess, and, and it has, however, gotten a lot of populist press, if you will. And that's this idea that uh, that there's motivations, financial motivations or economic motivations behind what's occurring. And so I wanted just to, to explain that briefly and uh, to, to Tim Furnish's uh, comments. I, I think that I'm very scared of, of, uh, of people that have not only strong religious motivations but are also have strong financial motivations to do what they do. So just to kind of put some framing around what the what is uh, some of the discussion that's occurring online, um, the the conversation that's occurring is that we have some highly motivated players, Russia being one of the most motivated players. As we know, Russia is a a huge supplier now of, of natural gas, particularly to Europe, but increasingly to China. So that's that's one of the players that we have to, one of the stakeholders that we have to consider. Uh, we also have Qatar, which uh, is is another emerging source of natural gas for Europe. In fact, uh, the, I think the interesting dynamic is that from 2003 to 2010, the uh, imports of natural gas from Qatar increased from 1% to 8% to the 27 countries that make up the EU. And so that uh, that was at the expense of Russia, or it would appear to have been at the expense of Russia, because in that same period, uh, their their percentage of imports fell from 45 to 31 percent to the to the EU. Now, of course, there are other dynamics, and and I've certainly not done the economics to uh, to understand this all, but I can just tell you this is what's being reported in the press, and that's some of the fact matter behind. Uh, that may be in support of, of those particular ideas. And so if we look at Syria and where it's positioned on the global map, it falls between Turkey, which is the, one of the primary transshipment points for, for uh, natural gas or for natural gas pipelines, uh, and Qatar. Uh, and then another player that we need to discuss is Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia uh, is, uh, has an interest in what happens. Uh, and, and so that's why we may see the Saudis, for instance, meeting with uh, with the Russian uh, with their Russian counterparts, and, and those discussions occurring. But in general, the idea here, or, or what's being discussed, is that Russia is trying to run a blocking move on Qatar, and the Saudis would support that because they're they're no great friends of the Qataris in terms of, of their business relationship or the the dynamic of, of world oil. Uh, so the idea is Russia is trying to run a, a, a blocking move uh, to keep Qatar from using Syria as a, a pathway to get to a transshipment point to Europe. And that, that actually makes some sense because when you think about it, uh, most of the or, or much of the gas, I should, or the natural gas that's being delivered to Europe, to Western Europe at this point, is by liquefied natural gas, and, and that moves by sea. And that uh, that is a much riskier proposition uh, from a producer standpoint. Uh, it's also much more costly than, than using pipelines. Pipelines have the lowest uh, cost for the transport methods that are available. So, so I just wanted to put that out on the table and uh, remind everyone that uh, uh, there may be unseen reasons uh, and that they probably are worth factoring into their thinking in the conversation. So. James, thank you. As I as I really get into uh, the dynamics, uh, political dynamics, and the special interest of all the countries and uh, Russia's interest in this, as well as Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and all Syria, and all the players in the Middle East, 
we're talking about uh, of, of, of information or subject outside the religious interest, but we get into billions of dollars of who's going to ship the oil to Europe and who's going to, not oil, but natural gas, and who's going to control it. Uh, so we're looking at uh, tremendous amounts of money as well as uh, uh, the influence of uh, Western industry. And it makes me wonder, as I've struggled to understand why members of Congress would support our going to war and to fire a shot across the bow in Syria with no plan uh, and anticipation of the outcome. But as I look at the dynamics involved in this, uh, the economic dynamics and political uh, power structure of this natural gas pipeline and where it's going to go, uh, is just uh, uh, it, 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 it's that kind of thing where money can corrupt power. And I'm not going to I'm not going to state that people in Congress are being paid off, but it made me wonder if Obama decided not to launch his own personal attack because none of this information we're discussing about the pipeline is available in the media. We've not heard it in the media, and we've not heard it from any of the testimony in Congress. So this is really being kept in the background, I think, intentionally, and we're just seeing, as you made, uh, as you stated, uh, this kind of information in social media, but it's verified, and the people who are writing about it are highly credible. So therefore, Obama really needs the support of Congress, because if it comes out that, and I'm not making any allegations, it comes out that there is a free flow of money into uh, special interest pockets, uh, that can be very, very dangerous. And, uh, again, I'm not making any allegations about the folks in Congress, but if you have full congressional backing of it, it's so much harder to prove. But I think that this is uh, certainly a topic that we need to insert into the narrative. What are the dynamics of, uh, and the influence of these countries who are willing uh, to go to war uh, over this energy, this natural gas pipeline, and who's going to control it, and then you've got that, all the other information that Dr. Tim Furnish has spoken about that make the uh, the conflict between the and the disputes between the Hatfield and the McCoys. Uh, well, Michael, speaking of which, can I weigh in here in support of James? I just put a little do. gloss on it. No, um, I, if I missed it, I didn't hear you mention Iran. Um, Iran, a couple of years ago, there's a major gas pipeline that Iraq agreed to construct from Iran through Syria uh, to go out through Latakia, which is Syria's main port in the northern Mediterranean. Um, because basically, again, one of the other unintended consequences of our invasion of Iraq was basically Iraq and Iran are now much cozier than they ever were because the Shiite majority government runs Iraq, and that's the same religion as in Iran. But yes, I mean, to piggyback on what James said, and just a little different take on it, um, Iran has a large financial interest in keeping uh, the Assad Alawi regime in power. Um, it, I mean, usually you hear just presented that Iran wants to keep uh, particularly the people that, that, that want us to attack Assyria uh, in order to help Israel. You, you hear that uh, Iran only supports Syria so they have access to Hezbollah and the other so-called terrorist groups in Lebanon. And that is a large consideration. But also Iran has a lot of money invested in Syria, and they have a huge natural gas pipeline. I'm not sure what the status of it is. I don't know if it's ever been finished, but the idea was for them to run a pipeline all the way from Iran through Iraq, across Syria, and out to the Mediterranean. And, uh, Tim, I'm really glad you came in with that information. And then you tie the Russians into it because if the Russians also have influence uh, with that pipeline through Iran and Syria, both of whom are Russian clients, then this is going to help Russia tremendously. If the pipeline is routed elsewhere and controlled by others, Russia will suffer. I'm not going to – I don't want to use the word devastating economic impact, but it will be uh, – uh, it will hurt – Russia economically when they badly need uh, this revenue and control. So when we look at Russia's involvement in Syria, it goes far beyond the support of the various Islamic factions 
to ensure that uh, they are not only going to lose that they not lose power, but they not lose revenue that is needed. So when we have those kind of dynamics, they uh, that the assassination of this petty archduke that uh, precipitated World War One is so much is very very minor in comparison to the dynamics, uh, religious, geopolitical, and economic, uh, in that part of the world that will set our future. And uh, uh, a lot of folks are worried about this being the start of World War Three. And hence that uh, comment uh, on Drudge where Putin said that this could be, uh, his words were, Russia warns of nuclear disaster if Syria is attacked. So the thing that causes me concern here is that the mainstream media has not discussed this pipeline and all the economic developments and dynamics involved in it, and neither have we heard any discussion of it in Congress. So it looks as if they're wanting to keep that as an aside and not let this get into the uh, mainstream narrative so folks see what's really going on behind the curtain from another perspective. I, I throw that open uh, out to, uh, for comment to anyone. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to jump in on that one. I, th I think you kind of hit the nail on the head with that, Michael. Uh, the, the problem that we face is, the, is a real lack of transparency in terms of motivation of, of the players. Uh, we just don't know enough about the region, period, and we certainly uh, can't guess uh, what all the motivations are. Uh, and to that point, we can't even guess what the motivations of our congressmen are, and, and that concerns me most because that's the one thing that potentially we can do something about. There was the Stock Act of 2012 that lasted about a year until April 15th of the following year, and, and the intent of that act was to, to make available online uh, the investment activities of of the um, uh, members of Congress and, and others in the federal bureaucracy. And that was uh, substantially defanged by uh, something that occurred, uh, again, on April 15, 2013, which was basically a, a recension or a revision of that act. So uh, those kinds of things really concern me. If I don't know the motivation of the players uh, and I can't uh, get to the motivation of the players, particularly those players who I hold nearest and dearest, I'm, I'm concerned about that. So. Well, I understand that uh, that uh, uh, some folks, and I won't name the folks unless you want to uh, go there, uh, who are looking at drafting legislation available uh, that would apply to uh, state elected officials, but it also uh, would extend, of course, to federal uh, congressional representatives as well to make financial disclosures available. But, of course, those things are hard, are so very, very hard to uh, prove because you can always have money placed uh, in a special bank account in the National Bank of Saudi Arabia or the National Bank of Qatar, and uh, none of that can ever be traced. Yeah, that, that's possibly true. Uh, again, we can do what we can do, and I think those are the actions we need to take. Uh, I am very interested in what's occurring at the state level. I do think it's a potential way to approach the problem, uh, and, and hopefully it's something that uh, will come to fruition and we can discuss in, in a future show. So I, I think so because it may very well be that uh, we have come full circle and, the, uh, and our future and our fate is going to be uh, governed by the states, and rightfully so according to the Constitution as the federal government has overreached uh, uh, and is becoming uh, more tyrannical and intrusive. So it's time for the states to rein back in the federal government. The only problem is most of the state legislatures also don't understand the Constitution, nor are they so much interested in diluting their comfortable position. So, But I want to thank... Uh, uh, all of our guests and their valuable perspectives, and they've provided us with information that is generally not available in the media, and especially they are not beholden to any special interest. We will be back next week, and we hope that you have found the show to be both informative and interesting. Please tell your friends about the show and where to find us, because if we are to turn our country around, it will take all of us working together. My email address is mopitz at mindspring.com. That's M-O-P-I-T-Z at mindspring.com. Remember, knowledge is power and ignorance is slavery. This is Michael Opitz wishing you a blessed day.
Thank you.